See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. The entire market has shifted. The labor shortage is even more severe now. Demands from the workforce has changed. The generations are changing. And this is a big issue with nurses, and it is being safe at work. We don't have a workforce shortage in healthcare. We have the workforce doing the wrong thing. Vacancy rates are astronomical. Very high, <laughs> right? And then the other piece that's really eating on nurses is they're still recovering from moral injury. We are laser focused on supporting the mental health and well being of our healthcare workforce. The whole care environment needs to be transformed. Hey, see you now, listeners. Shauna Butler here. During summer, we're on the road, meeting new ideas and people, and contributing to some of the most pressing conversations in health and society. In this episode, we're taking you with us on our adventure at the Aspen Ideas Health Conference, held in the stunning summer mountains of Aspen, Colorado. Aspen Ideas Health is known and appreciated for bringing together a wide range of experts, activists, and leaders for stimulating and provocative discussions and conversations. In over 60 sessions, the conversations both on and off the stage are designed to engage a broad audience in the issues that shape our lives, challenge our times, and introduce us to leaders and ideas that chart pathways toward better help for all. At the intersection of Aspen's 2023 themes of health, society, and our economy, the health and well-being of clinicians took center stage. High vacancy and turnover rates in our healthcare workforce are today's well-documented reality, putting safe, affordable, quality healthcare at risk for everyone. In this well-attended panel discussion led by See You Now, we spoke candidly about addressing the moral distress of the healthcare workforce and about the systemic, institutional, and policy changes urgently needed and readily available for enthusiastic adoption. So thanks for joining our session and let's get started. Thank you. And first, thank you. Thank you for being here with us. And I know why you're all here because everybody needs and is looking for nurses and you have come to the right place. The headlines across the country, but actually across the globe, share uh, really alarming stories and details about nurse vacancies, nurse departures, their distress, their concern for patient safety, and just how hard it makes it for all of us to deliver the care, the broad spectrum of care that all of our communities need and deserve. And actually, our healthcare workplaces and work practices are exhausting and many times demoralizing. And we've seen those stories. And this emotional and physical toll that it's taken really does explain why you're seeing a lot of very talented, very skilled, very dedicated healthcare professionals deciding to depart. And what this does is that it leaves a crisis in caring. And when we have a crisis in caring, when it's left unaddressed, what that means is it's harder for people to get care. Healthcare costs more. Our disparities in our health widen and worsen. And actually, care just feels less caring. I am Shauna Butler. I am a nurse, and I am obsessed with the economics, the policies, and the technology of health, how it gets delivered, the podcast See You Now. We explore all of these societal challenges, how they show up in healthcare's door, and very specifically, how nurses are leading and addressing them. And I have colleagues who are equally obsessed, and they are also very concerned about the well-being, the safety, the readiness and the preparation of our healthcare workforce. Um, we're actually here today to share with you and amplify the U.S. Surgeon General's recent advisory on looking at the extreme moral distress that our healthcare workforce is experiencing, but more importantly, the actions that are necessary and readily available for us to take to actually improve the lives and the practice of our healthcare providers that then you all get to benefit from. I'm really curious how many of you have actually experienced a delay in care or seen care that felt really rushed and maybe you didn't feel like it was the care you wanted. Yeah, 
I, I see a lot of head nodding. Um, I'm sorry about that. We are doing our best. But today joining me, I have colleagues who are going to share some of their wisdom and their experience. Iman Abuzaid is the co-founder and the CEO of Incredible Health, data-driven platform that is actually helping nurses find and do their very best work, live their best lives, and employers their ability to hire in less than 20 days versus the 90-day average of permanent employment. Kathy Howell is a chief nursing executive at UC Health, UC Colorado Health Systems. I'm sure that many of you have gotten your care from her team. It's a large nonprofit health system with a workforce of 28,000 employees. And Corey Feist, very seasoned healthcare executive and recently the CEO of the University of Virginia Physicians Group. So that's about 1,200 plus physicians. But more recently, the co-founder and the CEO of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation. And I'm also very pleased to say that the co-founder of that, Jennifer Breen Feist, is here with us in the audience today. So I want to thank her for being here. What I want to start out with is a little bit of context setting and attention-grabbing stats. Each one of them is working on some portion of the distress in the healthcare workforce problem. So, Corey, I'd love for you to you know set some context and provide some alarming alarming statistics about what you're yeah the scare right, the I'm room. Gonna stand because yeah, I'm going to run out the back. <laughs> who you're talking to yeah. and what you're hearing. From. Thank you, Shauna. Thanks for everyone being here. You know, our, the Dr. Lorna Bean Heroes Foundation was created by my wife Jennifer and I in 2020. And our entire team is laser focused on this issue. We are laser focused on supporting the mental health and well-being of our healthcare workforce. Um, I'm going to go through some stats, but you're probably not going to be able to remember or recite all of them at the end. But, but I want you to walk away, at least hopefully, feeling prepared to have a conversation about this, uh, feeling inspired that there's work to be done, but more importantly, feeling committed to join us all in this arena that we've decided to dedicate our lives to. Um, as Shauna said, I've been working my entire career in healthcare. First, as, a, as an attorney, don't, I was on the good side, uh, <laughs> if there's such a thing. But then I found religion, got an MBA, and uh, became a CEO. I'm still working through the ethics process. It's tough. Uh, but, but I was in healthcare my whole career, which is why, following a family tragedy, the outcry from the healthcare workforce to our family tragedy by thousands and thousands of healthcare workers that Jennifer and I didn't know before they responded to us was why she and I and now our broader foundation have stepped into this arena and stayed in this arena. Um, for those of you who may know or may be familiar with Lorna's story, she was an emergency medicine physician at the peak of the pandemic in New York City. Uh, she worked at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And over the span of just three weeks, just a three-week period of time, treated confirmed COVID patients, contracted the virus herself, and then returned to an overwhelming, relentless number of incredibly sick and dying patients, which caused for her her first and only mental health issue of her whole life. We like to say that Lorna answered the call for her city and her country and obviously her patients, but when she needed to make a call to take care of her own mental health and well-being, she was so fearful of the professional repercussions that she died by suicide on April 26, 2020. Only 12 hours after that, the New York Times decided it was in their best interest over the family's objection to publish her cause of death. So we're here today. Um, but after that, after that publicity, we heard every day for years now from healthcare workers about the conditions in healthcare. And the consistent refrain was, enough is enough. The working conditions, the culture, the high incidence of suicide, I don't know how many of you knew this before the conversation, and the mental health obstacles were all challenged the challenges that Lorna faced, um, and we could not simply ignore them as a foundation. So among the issues that the workforce raised to our attention were the fact that nurses and physicians in this country die by suicide at twice the rate of the general population. I have a, a physician statistic on this in terms of a total number, but 400 doctors a year pre-pandemic were dying by suicide in this country. That was before we asked healthcare workers to put aside their own safety, take care of our friends, our family members, put themselves in harm's way. 
And like Lorna, many nurses and many physicians and other healthcare workers suffer in silence due to these cultural obstacles. So let's talk at some of these numbers for just a second. Pre-pandemic, 96% of medical professionals agreed that burnout was an issue. 35 to 54% of nurses and physicians and 45 to 60% of medical students and residents were already reporting symptoms of burnout before the pandemic. 42% of physicians were reluctant to get any kind of treatment. 69% of nurses say they put patient health and safety before their own. And only 31% felt like their employers cared about their mental health. Throughout the past 36 months, our foundation has been working with all healthcare professionals, trying to scale solutions at the policy level and at the practical level. And one of the most exciting things we got to do was in an 18-month period of time, pass the first ever federal legislation looking out for the, the well-being of the healthcare workforce, named after Jen's sister, Lorna, the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act, signed by President Biden last March. Um, and shortly thereafter, we launched this all-in well-being first national movement. No, we call it well-being first, because that's what needs to happen here. We did that with our partners at Harvard, at Thrive Global, at the Creative Artists Agency, and organizations that represent over a million healthcare workers. As part of that, we created a Caring for Caregivers program, which has all these data-driven steps. And here's some more data for you, so get ready. One of my favorite parts of the data-driven steps is to eliminate the stupid stuff, we call it. <laughs> well, when you think that half of a nurse's time, 50% of a nurse's time, and 70% of a doctor's time in this country is spent doing administrative work, not taking care of patients, I consistently argue that we don't have a workforce shortage in healthcare. We have the workforce doing the wrong thing in healthcare right now. Yeah. Thank you. So let me share with you very briefly what happened after the law passed, and then I'll wrap up with the stats. The Surgeon General, in May of 2020, issued his advisory on healthcare worker burnout. The National Academy of Medicine, a couple months later, published their national plan for healthcare worker well being. Then in October, the American Hospital Association published its first ever suicide prevention guide. So now, where are we? Where are we in this conversation? Now we have 64% of nurses stressed, 57% exhausted, 43% burnt out. 53% of doctors are burnt out. 23% of them, by the way, are experiencing depression, which is four times the, adult, the average adult population experiencing depression. 60% of healthcare workers say stress from the pandemic has harmed their mental health. And here's the most tragic piece. Less than 50% of healthcare workers, regardless of role, feel valued and supported by the organizations that they work in. So I want to just wrap up with the number one driver of all of this. Pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and post-pandemic. Spoiler alert, it wasn't the pandemic. It was the administrative burden that healthcare workers carry every day. That continues to be the number one driver. While there are a myriad of factors, a myriad of factors, we are laser focused right now on these big boulders. As we think of where we go, as Sean, I've just asked you to raise your hands and think about like, where have you experienced this? This is an increase in medical errors, a decrease in ability to get to a doctor or a nurse, be treated. Um, these are all experiences that we're having. And as we kind of move into the rest of the panel, I just want to invite you all to join us in this arena. We've all decided to lock arms on this issue because it actually impacts every single person in this room, directly or indirectly. So that's the work, and I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. And I, I, want, I want you to know that I feel Lorna's spirit very strongly here today, and I'm very grateful for the fact that you have taken this on. Um, Iman, is it one in four nurses in this country who are on your platform? Correct, yeah. And how many um, health systems are you chatting with, So we work with? We work yeah. with over 700 hospitals uh, across the country, including large ones like HCA and Tenant, um, academic medical centers like Johns Hopkins and Stanford, lots of community systems as well. Yeah. Okay, so what are you hearing um, as far as the message that they're sharing with you, and what is it that's um, working? You know, I think we are hearing what the pain is, um, we know what that is. Yeah. What, are, what are the requests and what are the things maybe as far as mindset 
that um, are getting in the way of doing some of these things that Corey and the foundation are working on. Yeah, so what we're hearing from the nurses, because you know, when they're signing up and creating a profile on our platform, we're asking, well, why is it that you're considering leaving your job? Number one is they're looking for more career advancement opportunities. They want training programs, the ability to cross-train to another specialty, the ability to move into management, um, the ability to get specialized faster. This is definitely a workforce that is looking to advance their career. The second thing that we are hearing more and more, uh, and it's showing up in our data, is a desire for more flexible scheduling. 80% of nurses want more flexible schedules. You know, they're busy people. <laughs> They've got kids. They're caring for older, for older uh, family members as well. And they want to be able to fit work into their life. But even though 80% of nurses want more flexible schedules, only 11% of hospitals offer flexible schedules. Another area is, you know, the desire to pursue opportunities all over the country, to relocate, even to reduce their commute time, even in their current city. When you apply the, the more traditional way uh, to other hospitals and health systems, you know, you usually don't even hear back. Right? You apply to 10, 15 places, you usually do not hear back. And so there's something very broken and there. there is, by the way. <laughs> right? There are high vacancy rates. You hear yeah. this word shortage. Say that again. Like, people don't respond. You've got nurses who are applying yeah. for open positions, and they don't hear back. They don't hear back. They and, don't hear back. And then, and then finally, just, you know, of course, uh, this is table stakes, but compensation benefits... You know, desire for, for, for more of that. Now, I now, look, I do empathize with the other side, right? I empathize with the hospital leaders. You're they, sitting next to one. I'm sitting next to one, too, you know? <laughs> I mean, they have a tough job, right? They are running uh, businesses that are very low margin uh, and, you know, less than 2% margins usually. And uh, these temporary labor costs, many institutions have had to use temporary labor to fill in the gaps, cost three, four times more than their permanent uh, labor. And that eats into their bottom line. And so they, they are under pressure to solve these challenges. And then solving these challenges, though, is not that easy, especially when you have a workforce of 20, 28,000. Was that right? right? Um, and they are dealing with five generations in the nursing workforce, right, from the baby boomers all the way down to Gen Z. And guess what? Each generation wants something different. And our, our data shows that younger nurses, those the Gen Z and millennial nurses, they actually have more of a desire for the flexible schedules. They want to get specialized immediately, right after nursing school. They want to start specializing. The desire to get compensation raises is much more than older nurses. And so, so you know, they're, they have tough jobs. They're tackling all of this. But I am very hopeful about the time we're in now because there's been an enormous amount of media attention on this problem and on this workforce. The hospital leaders are more focused on this challenge and we're at a point where the CEOs, the COOs are diving into this problem too. It's not just the nursing leaders and HR leaders. And so I, I am hopeful about, you know, the changes that are to come. All right, Kathy. So you're one of these people yeah. that uh, uh, Iman is talking yes, about. Yes, I am. <laughs> so on a daily basis, you are immersed in the weight that so many of our healthcare professionals are carrying. You're seeing what is eating at their souls oftentimes. And this flexible scheduling piece, I mean, all the different types of solutions that you have available, you have been bringing in some really dramatically different approaches to how careers can be developed. Why don't you say more about like what you're hearing and more importantly, what are the things that you are working on that you're seeing actually make a difference? Yeah. You know, what you've all heard, what we can't do is continue to circle the drain. Um, and kind of our narrative is we cannot utilize a pre-pandemic approach to how we're dealing. And the whole care environment needs to be transformed. Because what you hear in the media and everywhere, and even our lots of our own executives hear this, is like, we just need to educate more nurses. You know, there's 4.2 million nurses, 85% are working. If the population keeps aging, we're going to need half a million more. You see all those stats. But we can't just keep that because that's the hamster wheel. What we've got to do is transform our care environments. The other piece, the two things that really, when I think of my team, um, and we have over 9,300 nurses, is number one, nurses have had a contract for decades and years with civil society. And that is, we'll care for you no matter what. You enter our doors, we ask no questions. We don't care where you come from, what you have, what your beliefs are. We care for you. And that's our oath we take. But that civil contract has been fractured. It was happening before the pandemic. The pandemic just amplified it. And this is a big issue with nurses. And it is being safe at work. One in four nurses have been assaulted in their career. Over 75% of the assaults that happen in work environments happen in healthcare. And there's so much incivility 
we've put, actually, I've been spending probably the most part of the last two years working on workplace violence prevention, educating our nurses and training our nurses to understand how to really um, even be physical and how to take somebody down because your life is at stake. I mean, 10 years ago in healthcare, when we were training on basic de-escalation, it was like, no, 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 that's security's job. Well, it's your life at hand. I mean, you know, nurses get choked, they get punched, they've been sexually assaulted. I can just tell you, and I get these, I get an email every morning, early morning, myself and our chief human resource officer across all those nurses and the other care team. And we get to read every day what happened. And then so much of that is underreported. So one big thing, and, and again, it's for us in civil society, is to say enough is enough. This is a sanctuary where you're getting care. And please be kind. And then the other piece that's really eating on nurses is they're still recovering from moral injury. I'm lucky to work for a health system that we have a chief wellness officer who is a physician. It is her academic interest. I work with Liz all the time and the nurses, and we put in a lot to support our teams. And I'll tell you what, we put in a call line in, I think it was 2020, 24-7. It is a licensed therapist on that line, three in the morning. We don't ask questions. You got an issue, you call them. And I'll tell you what, I think that has been a lifesaver for all of my nurses and we're having conversations that we didn't have pre-pandemic about how you deal with your mental health. It's starting to become more of our normal conversation, which is really healthy. And then also, we are each other's keeper. If you see me getting, you know, I'm going down the drain, please help out. And there's a number to call because pre-pandemic, we didn't have this. It was like, yeah, we had an EAP. We, we had lots of doctors around, you know, a psychiatrist to call. But it was like there was nothing instantaneously that you could call to get somebody immediate support. Um, so those are kind of the big issues out there that I'm dealing with with our teams. And as you say, I see a lot of healing happening. But you've got to, I mean, when you think about this globally across the country, we need every single health system to really be focused on this. And the board of directors is a great place to yeah. start. If any of you are on boards, board of directors demand it. Ask about what you're doing for the mental health of your teams, um, because that will help drive differences. So, Iman, you had mentioned that one of the major, the four major requests that all nurses have, flexible scheduling. So, first of all, I'm not sure how many people know what scheduling looks like when we're talking about this. <laughs> Kathy, you're in the best position to speak to what does scheduling look like. And more importantly, you guys are doing some really fun, interesting, exciting things they're dramatically shifting how people experience their careers. And one of the things, too, that I've had many nurses share with me is that, and particularly our younger nurses have said, I hear your generation. I don't want to go for this work-life balance. I am looking for life-work boundaries. Mm -hmm. And kudos to them for teaching me that. And so I'm <laughs> passing that all along to you. But why don't you speak to what these schedules look like and what you guys are doing? Yeah, a, a typical schedule, I'll just talk about a hospital nurse, is three 12-hour shifts a week, have some time off. They work every third Wait weekend. Wait a minute, three 12-hour shifts does not equal time off, but go ahead. Yes, <laughs> right. That's the normal schedule. What we did is last year we sent out a survey because we are modernizing our benefits globally for all 28,000. And, of course, flexibility came up to be number one for everyone. So we wanted to do a deep dive into our nursing team. So we sent to all of, all of our direct care nurses, 7,200 of them, to say, what does that really mean? You know, you've got this, you've got this, you've got this. And really what came back to us is, I want to have more extended time off. when I, I want to take off when I need to take off. And so we just launched in the middle of May a program where nurses can work three months and take a month off. Work three months, take a month off. We'll see how that goes. We also put into place what I call Match.com for nurses. It's called RN Match. And um, so I'm a nurse. I've been working neurology for four years. And it's like, gosh, I really would like to try emergency medicine. But I don't know if I really want to leave totally. How can I do both? So we have a matching program, competency-based, so that they can do part of their hours in neurology and the other ones in emergency medicine. And that's been real satisfying. But I have to tell you, you have to have lots of these. That's not enough. We have a lot of fellowships and career mobility programs. Um, I've tasked my team this year is like, I need an app. So if there's any producers out there or app builders out there, 
we need an app, a mobility app, that we can put in all of our programs online. I say, you know how it is when you're planning your financial life? It's like, if I save $25 for 100 years, I can retire. We need those apps that our teams have to know what's available to do because there's lots of opportunities for mobility. But, you know, I know them and my leaders know them, but does every frontline nurse know them? So that's our next big thing is, like, we need to develop this app and include everything there and then have career coaches that can really get on the app with you to really help you curate your career. So, Corey, Iman, you both are talking to a lot of system leaders. I think Kathy's an outlier. Am I right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> in, in a good way. Let's be clear. In a, yeah, in a good yeah, way. Yeah, in a good way. Good we want more of these outliers. Just, just yeah. make that clear. Yes. So I want you to speak to a couple of things. One is, what are the things that you're seeing that are actually working? Kathy's given us a couple of examples. But what is the mindset and the attitudes of those teams that allow them to let go of some old ideas that aren't serving us well? And maybe what are the things, why are they clinging so hard? Like, what do we need to help them with mindset? So first, what's working? And then two, what mindset needs to change? Mind you want to start? As, as far as what's working, and, and first of all, we have to determine what, w- let's define what's working. Essentially, the vacancy rate has to come down, the turnover rate has to come down, the, you know, the employee experience. Let, let, right? we say, Sorry. Give the numbers, like sure. what the vacancy rates are. Sure. I mean, the vacancy rates are astronomical. Very high, right. So we're talking about, you know, anywhere from, you know, four to 10% vacancy rates uh, in different parts of the country. As far as turnover goes, uh, the national turnover for hospital nurses is at 25% right now. Um, so that's think about your turnover. workforce, like annual turnover, how many, yeah. yeah. So these are uh, some very tough statistics to, to deal with and that are directly impacting the bottom line of the hospital too. And so as far as measuring what works, you, you have to tie your solutions to one of these important metrics, which are effectively financial metrics. You know, when you implement career mobility, like Kathy just described, what does that do to your retention? It likely improves it. When you hire more permanent nurses, how many travel nurses can you exit from your health system so you can save on those costs? So it's regardless of the solution, there are many solutions out there. So for career advancement, you know, there's the career mobility planning, the career tracks for nurses, the training programs for nurses. In the flexible scheduling place, essentially more and more leaders are offering a whole menu of options for schedules. Weekend shifts, eight-hour shifts, four-hour shifts. Virtual um, nursing. Virtual this, this Hybrid. Many, many options. Of course, very tough to manage operationally, but it is what the talent wants. And so all of these solutions all need to be tied to a financial argument. And when we see nursing leaders and HR leaders partnering really well with the finance leader, leaders and teams, that is actually when the magic happens. Because if you can propose programming and changes that are budget neutral, or let's say they do have costs associated with them, but the health system is going to save, you know, in the millions of dollars on the back end, that is, of course, anyone's going to agree. These are no-brainers then, right? It's, it's a, and at the end of the day, the hospital leaders are business leaders. And so all of these different topics that we're referring to uh, when we talk about the moral distress of the, of the healthcare workforce does actually boil down to dollars and cents. And if you can speak that language, then you're going to implement a lot of solutions. The other thing that I've seen be very successful is when hospital leaders recognize that the game has changed. I mean, it was, it was, I think it was one of the first statements out of Kathy's mouth, right? That we cannot operate like we did pre-pandemic. The entire market has shifted. The labor shortage is even more severe now. The demands from the workforce has changed. The generations are changing. So when they recognize that, hey, everything happening outside of my health system has completely changed, and everything inside and inside my system is starting to shift as well, I need to act, and I need to act fast. And when leaders do that, again, the magic happens. And Corey, I, I think one of the areas that I'd love for you to spend time on, because you're doing so much on the policy work, when you talk about get rid of the stupid stuff, you cannot recruit your way out of a retention problem. These are systemic-level problems, and we need system-level changes. And many of these are at the state and the federal policy level. So speak to that, like yeah, and, what you're and hearing. you can't yoga your way out of the problem either. Yeah. And so, in all seriousness, I mean, one of the things that we use as an analogy at our foundation, our chief medical officer talks, talks about you've got at least two things going on with healthcare workers right now. They need individual support and they need systems change. And the way she describes the individual support is applying pressure to a bleeding wound when a patient comes to the emergency room. But a lot of the things even that were discussed are individual support. And that's what the workforce has really felt heavily over the pandemic. Peer support programs and other programs have really scaled, which is great but they only apply pressure to this wound. What you have to get is underlying systems issues. 
and a lot of them are policy driven. Some of them are operationally driven. Um, we talked about getting rid of the stupid stuff. So the stupid stuff involves a lot of administrative burden that comes from external sources to healthcare. They can be driven by an electronic medical record that was designed to document for billing purposes, but is used for clinical workflows, so it's completely inefficient. Or it can be from insurance companies, as an example, who require an infinite number of prior authorizations, which add no value except to the bottom line of the insurance company. No offense to those who are insurance company in, in, this, in this room, but it's one of the biggest drivers. So what we've done is we've looked at a federal and a state level, and we basically said, you don't necessarily need to add more money to this issue, though the Lorna Breen Act added $140 million of new programs, which are desperately needed. But what you can also do is look, and you know, the Secretary of Health was here yesterday, and I was dying to ask him, what administrative burden that you all carry through HHS and CMS and others that you're requiring of your healthcare workforce doesn't add any value? Get rid of it. That can happen at a state level. That can happen at a federal level. And that's the kind of conversation we need to have. When I talk to policymakers at a state and federal level, often I'm just saying, even being aware of the additional burden you may be adding through different policy. Oh, it's just adding one more document that a physician or nurse has to fill out. Well, let's not do that. Let's redesign it so you don't have to do that. So that's, that's a big part of it. The other thing that we stumbled on, and this is what is so tragic among many things about my sister-in-law's story, is that she was incredibly fearful of the regulatory repercussions of getting mental health treatment. Those are real, and even as the general counsel of the medical group at the University of Virginia, I wasn't even aware of them because this is an issue that no one talks about. But they appear at a state level in licensing applications that nurses and doctors have to fill out. They appear at a local hospital level. When you go to apply to work there, you fill out a credentialing application. And all these questions, healthcare workers are taught from a very early age, you either can't get mental health treatment, if you need it, pay for it in cash, drive to another town, lie about it. And so what we've done in our foundation is we've actually established a toolkit. Wait for it, it's three steps, it's really basic. Audit your questions, change your questions, and tell people that you changed your questions. And so what we've been able to do is audit the country for nursing licensing and physician licensing on this particular issue, and we're just working the problem head to toe and literally changing the landscape. Um, I don't know if I could add a quick story. I got overnight, I got an yeah. email from a clinician in Oregon. Yesterday, we, or two days ago, we changed the licensing laws in Oregon. And the licensing board emailed all their licensees to say, guess what? We have eliminated these questions. Well, overnight, I got an email from a clinician in Oregon who said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm up for my renewal application, and I was terrified. You know, I want to contrast that, actually. Yesterday, I don't know how many of you got to hear Iman um, speaking with Andy Slavitt, and one of the questions that you got asked is, like, how are you taking care of you? And the first thing she said is, get a therapist. I don't know yeah, how, many, how many clinicians would be comfortable admitting that they're seeing a therapist. I think that they would be very fearful. I thought it was so interesting, like a CEO is, that's the recommendation and very comfortable publicly stating that. And I still think that there's a long way that we have to go for most and, of our clinicians to say, I'm receiving therapy or I'm on medication. And Shauna, I would just yeah. uh, punctuate that by saying, this is an issue that is, that is new to many, even if they sit on licensing boards or they sit on the policy mm -hmm. groups looking at these questions, like, oh, we haven't looked at these questions in decades. I'm like, well, that's the problem. They all violate the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yeah. Use our toolkit. It's free and change your stuff. So it's usually, there's, mm -hmm. there, it's usually met with a, a open arms. But what we didn't realize, even as healthcare leaders, because I have multiple degrees, but not an RN or an MD, I never walked that line. I didn't know how early and often the message is given that there are some opaque consequences to you taking care of yourself, whether it be mental health treatment or just taking a break. Yeah. It's a sign of strength to be burned out in the past. It is, and I think Lorna's story really epitomizes that because it wasn't the licensing laws that were preventing her from seeking care. It was the social pressures that you don't want to let your colleagues down. You wouldn't want to let other people know because then there's this question, can we trust you? So all of this needs to change. And all of you have mentioned statistics and metrics. So two things that I want you to address here. 
what are the really important metrics that we should be measuring and uh, sharing broadly so that people know how to assess the health and the well-being of their workforce, therefore their health systems, and what's the lowest hanging fruit for these types of changes so that we can see rapid change in those metrics of the health of our workforce. You know, maybe I'll yeah. start Kathy, with that. And, and of course, you look at your retention rates. And you also look at, and what we look at is there's, pe- there's, a, there's a concept called PRN. It's like a per diem. Like people maybe were in a, a full-time position. They cut their hours significantly, and then they can work on their own terms. We saw a huge, during the pandemic, we saw, we watched that data, we saw it. It's like, wow, what's happening? I mean, nurses always kind of did this because of life things, but we've seen it significantly, and we watch that number all the time. It's not a usual number you would think about. And of course, then our, our turnover and our retention rate as well. But the thing that every single health system should be doing exactly right now is what we call remove the pebbles from your shoes. And we actually use that language, and and my colleague, Dr. Harry, and myself, as I lead with nursing, is we have lots of listening sessions. And that's the one thing, you know, I've learned from many, many decades of not doing it right is listen, listen, listen to that front line and then do something about it. So we do all these listening sessions continually, and then it's like, okay, we got to do something about that. I mean, as simple as I, I laugh about this, my latest one were the pillow wars, Somebody decided last year that all of our nurse managers would be purchasing all the pillows for their units and tracking them. We're really ridiculous. I call it the pillow wars. They brought it up to me. I go, what? I said, this sounds like the pillow wars. And, and so we immediately said, that's not happening. Take that off of them. My goodness. You know, put a par level in, whatever, and it's done. But that's a simple one. But there's other big ones that really take care transformation. And, and I'm lucky to work with a very innovative CIO, and we have an innovation center. And what we do is take interested clinicians and say, come play with us. One of our last examples we did is around wound care nurses. Wound care nurses are in short supply. They're highly educated and very specific about what they do. So you never have enough of them. So we said, come play with us virtually, and let's figure out how we can make your days better so you can see all these patients. Because they had a backlog of patients that they couldn't see patients for three days. And I mean, it's a huge care and access issue. So they came and played with us for about six months in our virtual health center. They were able to develop some real specific algorithms based on data through the EMR and were able to see 40% more patients because they had one, they have one of the nurses that's virtual every day doing all prevention rounds. And then the other nurses that are on the units can really take care of those patients that really need lots of hands-on care. So they increased their productivity by 40%. Well, of course, that's great for a CFO to hear. But you know, what was more important, that's not what we were going after. It's like, how do we make your work life better? We were able to hire some technicians to help them, and they wanted them. And now they say we would never work in a different model again. But they designed it. We did not. Now, we didn't make a big deal about it at first because you take a clinician off the floor, and it's like, oh, my God. You know, the CEO knows I'm doing this, the CFO, the CNO. It's like, you know, there's too much stress on them. So we say, just go play for a while. Don't tell us what you're doing and come back with some ideas um, so that they can fail and be okay. Because that's the other big pressure is how do you fail? But we have to have our clinicians designing our care models of the future, and we've got to have avenues for them to do that. We're going to go to audience questions in just a second, and be ready. I want to, um, one of the things that you have, Iman, have really turned me on to and I've become um, a disciple and an evangelist about is removing friction because so much of the thing that we talk about is innovating on the care delivery side, but not really on the back end on the operational side. I mean, I've really caught the religion about that. So why don't you say just a little bit more and then we'll go to question. Yeah, absolutely. Look, there's, there's a lot of innovation in healthcare, especially uh, innovation that's patient facing. But the, the truth is the, the cost, the major costs in healthcare are in the back end of healthcare. The hiring, the operations of the health systems, you know, the boring stuff, basically, right? The very unsexy stuff. Very unsexy stuff, yeah. but that is like, a, you know, the majority of healthcare costs are tied up in that. You know, we, we really focus on the hiring piece. So the, I guess the interesting statistics I wanted to share was we operate in, across 27 states and many of the major metropolitan markets. When we started our company five years ago, we thought, hey, it's going to be the hospitals that pay the most and the ones with the biggest brands that are going to hire the most from our marketplace. And it turns out that's categorically false in every single market where we operate. And it turns out that the hospital and health system that has the fastest hiring speed hires the most. 
they beat the competition. They beat the health system with the, with the highest salaries. They beat the health system with a huge, you know, academic brand that's nationally and globally known. And they have just essentially said, when a nurse applies, we are going to implement this no nurse left behind philosophy. And we are going to find some place for this nurse to go somewhere in our giant health system. And interviews are going to be done in three days. Job offers are going to be made same day. You know, and we're going to get this nurse through the door. And that creates an extremely positive impression of an employer from a nurse's perspective. Like, wow, if that's my hiring experience, maybe the whole health system is running this way. <laughs> and it has really turned into a huge competitive advantage for those hospitals. So question over here. Have you got a microphone? Yeah. Hi, thank you all. I'm Heather Lane. I'm from Athena Health. We're a major manufacturer of electronic health record systems. And I know that you called out EHRs as a real pain point. And believe me, internally, we are acutely aware of this. We're aware of documentation overhead for providers and clinicians. We're aware of the pain points, you know, some of the pain points in our EHRs and so on. We're also aware of the potential that we can offer through, you know, the large data that we do have. I'm interested from each of your perspectives what we in the EHR markets can be doing to help this problem. You know, I, we have a project going on. It's called Project Joy, and it's in nursing. It's to streamline documentation to bring the joy back to nursing. But, you know, just having that ear and just being at the, the bedside with whether it's a physician or a nurse is really important. I think where we're going is the big data side of things. And how do we pull the data out to, to give us good information back, whether it's surveillance data, whatever. Um, I think that's important. So that makes sure your, your data and it's there is easy to retrieve. We have good algorithms. There's been good partnerships so that we can make something out of that data and put real high-performing teams on it to make change. I think we've got a primary care provider back here. Love this talk. Um, so I worked on a support team where we had, um, we said, you know, the physicians, as you say, the administrative burdens, and I'm doing the RN's work because we can't afford an RN, or I'm doing the PharmD's work because we can't afford a PharmD. You know, so if you hire the whole team, I had one site where I got the burnout rate down to zero. Oh, and bravo. bravo. <laughs> it didn't quite stay there, but it, 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 yeah. it went way down. And I, I had ways of looking at the data, and they said, I said, you know, you're putting in the same hours. What's the difference? And one doctor told me, the joy of medicine is back. Yeah. I am doing what I was trained to do. I have support around the patient. My patients can get a response quickly, and I can do what I'm trained to do. And when they say, can you add a patient? Yeah, of course, because I have that team. Instead of staying there till 8 or 9 at night or doing it at home where I'm continually doing the, all the administrative things. Um, so... It's more of a statement, but just kind of also, you know, I, where are we going with the alignment? I just joined Primary Care Collaborative, which is really trying to look at that alignment. The alignment uh, would be another panel. Question. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we hear you. But I do want to comment on your phrase about using joy. Um, I know, Corey, um, several of us have worked with organizations where there's joy in medicine, there's joy in nursing. And what I think is beautiful is that we are using that word and recognizing that um, this moral distress really comes from a place of where it's eating at the soul of people who are trying to care for people. And when you don't have that joy, and that's what so many of the, the work that the foundation is doing, that Iman's team is doing, that Kathy's team is doing, a lot of this is structural. A lot of this is alignment of business and strategy. But at the core of it, it's people taking care of people. And that goes from not only the employer taking care of the people, but when you take care of the people who take care of the people, there's so much joy in all of that. I um, think we've got time for one more question up here. Mackenzie? Yeah. Thank you for having this talk. I think it's um, 100% pertinent and also something that's been talked about for a long, long time. The nursing staff and the workforce has been talked about since before I was in school for it. Um, so I appreciate you guys. I think Dominique kind of touched on this a little bit, the why. I mean, obviously the joy of it, but I think there's a systems change we talk about throughout this whole conference that's not necessarily going to happen without policy and advocacy. And I'd actually like to hear from Corey about your thoughts on that just because you have been doing that work. Um, and then also how you're incorporating the, the frontline staff into that work specifically. Yeah, so we would, we'd love your help. Uh, <laughs> I, I honestly, I mean, 
we were, Shauna and I were talking about, uh, she storms the Capitol in Austin on a regular basis, and they give her tons of reasons to do it daily. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, nurses and physicians and other healthcare professionals are so well trusted by members of both parties that your ability to go with a consistent message to Capitol Hill, share your story, and share solutions, I think is actually one of the most powerful things. We need to get... Um, all kind of healthcare professionals elected into local and state government as well as federal government. I was recently doing a talk in Montana and they were looking at some of the, this was in the last year, so it was the, the, the post-Roe world and they were, the, 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 there was a bunch of doctors and they were lamenting the fact that a bunch of policymakers had come up with laws that were just completely impractical and that makes perfect sense given that there wasn't a clinician in the room. So you just, I think you need to be absolutely active and part of it. And I would say alignment on your message and what solutions are. As you know, healthcare is like the most siloed industry. And so what I hear is often doctors want one thing, hospitals want another, nurses want another, but locking arms around what the solutions are to make the environment better, what those policy solutions are, pre-authorizations, all of those kind of things, I think that's the key. And I will tell you, when we got our federal law passed in 18 months, it usually takes about a decade to do that. But we did it because we brought your stories with us. Never lose sight of the power of your story. Brene Brown calls stories data with soul, right? Mm, yeah. And yeah. those are what move policymakers. So I'd love to talk to you after this, too. Yeah. And that is such a great plug for all of you to subscribe to the See You Now podcast so you can hear, <laughs> and hear all of their stories. Now you have an image. Now, yeah, yeah, you, now an image. you know what the voice really looks like. We've shared a lot of data and some really great stories. What I want to leave you with is that people who are on all levels of healthcare, it's not just front lines, it's all levels, they are carrying a lot of stress, a lot of distress, a lot of burden oftentimes. But the number one reason why they stay, they stay for their colleagues. And that is this real power of bringing the joy back to the work that we do. We shared with you some very jolting statistics. We want to because when you feel things, you will be motivated to act and motivated to take on these incredible, easy to implement solutions, actually. They're not that hard. It's more the mindset. And it's when we have these conversations and we share the stories and we have the evidence and the data to back it up. That's where the movement really happens. So I just wanted to leave you with that and thank this incredible group of folks. Yeah. Corey Feist, Iman Abuzaid, and Kathy Howell. Corey, Iman, and Kathy joined us live on stage at Aspen Ideas Help, where with great candor, urgency, and optimism, they share the necessary actions that are readily available to confront and address the distress and moral injury our healthcare workforce is experiencing. To watch this and all the Aspen Ideas Help sessions, visit seeyounowpodcast.com for links to the videos. And next summer, make plans to join us live in Aspen to take it all in and add your insights and ideas to Aspen Ideas Help. This forthright conversation, along with the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory on building a thriving health workforce, is loaded with evidence, recommendations, and resources, and reveals how urgently action is needed to, as Kathy reveals, transform the whole care environment so clinicians and the patients they care for can thrive. And if you're ready to take action, you definitely want to register for the Nurse Hack for Help Virtual Hackathon, September 22nd through 24th. This fast-paced, enthusiasm-driven event brings together nurses and health innovators from around the globe to ideate and pitch ideas aimed squarely at catalyzing a healthy environment for nurses and the patients they care for. Selected teams will have an opportunity to further progress their ideas with funding, scholarships, and more. Register now at nursehackforhealth.org. That's nursehack, the number four, help.org. Piling on to the theme of catalyzing healthy work environments at the system and policy level, coming up in our next episode, 
We're excited to introduce you to our friends at Radio Advisory Podcast for even more great insights on what works to make work better. From Advisory Board, we're bringing you a radio advisory. Sometimes we we get very connected to the work that we've created in the past, and we, we do not sunset things well. This leadership style that we are implementing is, you know, completely moving away from command and control towards unleashing and inspiring people to say, you come up with ideas. Our job is to knock the barriers down to put those ideas into place. Hearing it is one thing. How we go out and demonstrate it is something else. Go start talking to your nurses or get an executive team to say, what are your own policies that are burdensome and the burden exceeds the benefits? What technologies might you do to really, truly take away work and then make sure that you actually implement them? For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.